Hey everyone, a couple quick notes before we begin. We had a great chat with our guest Yilin Wong, and we feel it stands on its own two feet, so there's no gameable ideas or stealing his art segments this time, but you'll find plenty of ideas worth stealing anyway. Also, we did not do our typical Patreon shout-out, but we want each and every one of you to know that we appreciate your support so much. Thank you. All right, with no further ado, on to the episode. Enjoy! It's Zhang Hu Hustle. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Zhang Hu Hustle. I'm here with my co-host, Eric Farmer. And I'm here with special guest, Yi Lin Wang. And I'm here with the first guy, Eli Kurtz. Today, we're watching The Brave Archer and chatting about adapting wuxia novels to film. And we're really glad to have Yilin here because she's pretty knowledgeable about wuxia uh, as both a writer and translator. So thanks so much for coming on the show, Yilin. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. Can you uh, tell us a little bit about your work as a writer and translator and sort of how that relates to wuxia? Yeah, sure. So I'm currently working on like a novel that draws heavily on the genre of wuxia. So um, that's kind of one of my main interests. And this summer, I translated a short story that's appearing in an upcoming issue of Pathlight, which um, is like a wuxia themed special issue. So I'm really excited about that. And also last summer, I spent three months in traveling in China and Hong Kong, visiting different like wuxia related locales for research. That's very cool. Yeah, we saw that you uh, had been to uh, Xingxiang and Wudan Mountains, which is very exciting. Yeah, I did. We, uh, we know Wudan, of course, from Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon and several other movies that we've seen. But Xingxiang, we only saw most recently in... Uh, the episode that we did, or the two episodes that we did on Smiling Proud Wanderer. Can you tell us a little bit about your experiences there? Yeah, so I'm Sichuanese. I was born in Sichuan, and Qingchen is in Chengdu, which is the capital city of Sichuan. So I haven't been there before, but last year I went to visit, and actually a family friend is a disciple of the grandmaster there. So he introduced me and I got to go and visit and meet the grand master and talk to him a bit and like hang out for a few days. And I was able to like learn some kind of basic martial arts from one of the masters there. And that was really fun. And it was like really interesting research. That's very cool. I think I saw that the grand master had uh, considered taking on as a disciple. Yeah, we were joking about that. So I said that I would go back and visit again, maybe next year. So I need to train some more to do that, I think. <laughs> <laughs> That's so cool. But, you know, like a uh, good thing to look forward to, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So for those of you who are listening, we will have links to Elin's website and some of her works as well in the show notes. And like I said, we're very excited to have her on to talk about our movie today, which is The Brave Archer. So. We'll go ahead and get into discussing the film, but I did want to say, first of all, that there is a content warning for this film. There's some animal cruelty. It is fairly graphic. So, you know, please note that about this movie. Okay, so The Brave Archer from 1977. Uh, it was directed by Chang Che. The writer was Ni Kuang. The director of photography was Kung Mu To, and the choreographer was Li Ka Ting. I see in the notes here, you have a little something about the writer, Yi Lin. Yeah, so um, last summer I was in Hong Kong doing research and part of my research was on kind of Jin Yong's relationship with other authors and also his translation. And doing that research, I actually came across Ni Kwan's name because he is like a good friend of Ni Kwan's. And from what I understand is that Ni Kwan and him go way back. And um, Ni Kwan actually was like a ghostwriter very briefly for one of Jin Yong's later novels. I think um, that me gods and semi devils. Okay. Yeah. That's come up on the show before. Cool. Yeah. So I think there's a story about how Jin Yong was like a way or something when it was being serialized in like a newspaper. So Jin Yong asked him like to take over and then he just like one of the characters and then blinded the character. <laughs> and then Jin Yong came back and was upset. <laughs> that's amazing yeah and for those uh who are familiar with the show ni kuang has also written both of the 36 chamber movies that we watched as well as battle wizard which is an adaptation of demigods and semi-devils 
and Human Lanterns, which we didn't like very much, but you know, uh, four out of five ain't bad. <laughs> <laughs> so the cast for this movie is immense. And we really streamlined the cast for the purposes of relating it to you. We basically boiled it down to the four main characters, but there are a lot of other names that you'll hear throughout our plot summary. Uh, we just want to kind of set that up in advance. And if you take a look at the show notes, you'll see all of those characters listed as one in the cast section. We're just not going to go over all of them. And if you watch the movie, there is a stellar four or five minute introduction panel with all of the characters that is is unusual and something to behold yeah it's quite a montage uh so yilin would you like to read off these uh cast and characters for us here yeah sure um fusen as guo jing the i mean as yang kang niu tian as huang rong and ku kuang chang as huang yao si eastern vietnam We'll go ahead and get into the plot here. And like I said, you'll hear a lot more character names. Just, you know, bear with us. This is quite a, a bear of a movie. So when Emperor Huizong ruled the Song Dynasty, two heroes lived in the north. These sworn brothers got tangled up with a Taoist priest and the Mongol Empire, and they died as a result of that entanglement. Uh, the survivors of this fight claimed the hero's sons and swore to train them to fight each other in 18 years time. Guo Jing, an earnest but unintelligent boy, went to train with a group called the Weird Seven, a group of chivalrous heroes. And Yang Kang, a clever but treacherous boy, was taken by a Mongol prince. During Guo Jing's training, he ran into Chen Shuangfeng and Mei Chaofeng, married warriors who were trained in the skull-piercing techniques of Peach Blossom Island. Guo Jing killed the husband while defending one of his teachers, while the wife was blinded by one of the other Weird Seven, now the Weird Six, since one of them died in this battle. So Guo Jing goes to the city, where he meets Yang Kang, spars with him briefly, and has a run-in with Yang Qixin, Yang Kang's real father, still alive and in hiding. Guo Jing meets some formidable warriors and befriends a young woman disguised as a beggar boy. We soon find out she is Huang Rong, daughter daughter of Eastern Venom Peach Blossom Island. They sneak into the Mongol palace, challenge the, the warriors, and free the disguised Yang Qinxian and his adopted daughters from prison. In the course of all of this, Gu Jing gains power by learning basic cultivation techniques from a Taoist priest and accidentally drinking the blood of an empowered python when it attacks him. Then Mei Chaofeng, now blind, shows up and we learn that she carries the first part of the Jiaoyin swordplay manual on the skinned flesh of her dead husband and needs to find the second part to return to her master, Eastern Phantom. Yang Tixi escapes the Mongol palace with his long-lost wife. They flee to the country, meet up with the Taoists who started this mess and commit suicide together with the Mongols and Yang Kang show up to take the wife back. We learn Yang Kang has been learning to fight from the Taoist priest, but also from the dastardly Mei Taofeng. The weird six arrived to help drive off the Mongols, then Guo Jing and Huang Rong decide to travel south to Peach Blossom Island. They meet Northern Beggar along the way, who teaches 15 of the dragon 18 palms to Guo Jing. On Peach Blossom Island, Guo Jing clashes with Eastern Venom, then retreats to the peach groves. There he meets the obstinate Zhu Botang, and they swear brotherhood, and Zhu teaches Guo Jing several fighting styles. We learn Zhu Botang was entrusted with both parts of the Zhao Ying manual, but was forbidden from learning it or teaching it to anyone. Eastern Venom learned the second part of the manual thanks to treachery and his wife's photographic memory. Then he stole the first part from Zhu Botang and trapped him on the island 15 years ago. Zhu trains Guo Jing for a month and a half until he learns that Huang Rong's father promises her hand in marriage to the Southern Venom. Northern Beggar shows up and cons Eastern Venom to promise Huang Rong to Guo Jing instead. Eastern Venom resolves the dilemma by testing both suitors, with a fight against their respective masters, with a drumming contest that lasts all winter, and with a recitation contest. Guo Jing wins by a narrow margin and marries Huang Rong. So, you know, very simple story, straightforward, oh my right? <laughs> this movie is a mess. <laughs> so much happens. Yeah, well, it's my understanding. So I haven't read Legend of the Condor Heroes, but I know the two of you have read at least, uh, Yilin, you've read it, I think, both in Chinese and in English. Yeah. And Eric, I know that you are working on the first translated book in English. Mm -hmm. So I know that 
it's a very long story, uh, originally serialized in Jin Young's uh, newspaper. And I know that this movie tries to capture a lot of it, but this movie also has sequels that tell more of the story. So I want to talk a little bit about some similarities and differences between the story that we see presented in this movie versus, you know, the part of the book that this movie covers. So I think to start, the beginning of the movie is very similar to a lot of adaptations that I've seen with like the Taoist showing up at the two brothers' home and having that kind of backstory. So I think that is one thing that stood out to me as like very similar. And also the island. So like near the end on the Peach Blossom Island, the scene where like Guo Jing has to kind of take this test to try to marry Huang Rong, basically. Sure. And then, then they've sort of interwoven, like we meet the the weird seven or the seven freaks of the South, as they're called in the, in the English translation, uh, in the book, uh, we meet we meet them much, much earlier in the story, basically right away. Yeah. I mean, I understood this more now that I've read the book, but, uh, it, it is sort of a challenging movie to sort of follow because I think that they just assume that, you know, the story and are just (laughs) like happy to move along. Would you agree with that? Elin? Yeah, yeah. I feel like it was as if they knew because the not the series was so well known that these characters they're like all really familiar with. So they just kind of really quickly kind of ran shoot the plot rather than kind of really develop like the middle, for example. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yulin, I know that you were on the Bedrock podcast with uh, Brendan Davis. Yeah. He had commented on our last episode, I had asked him about the nature of adapting wuxia stories to film. And he had said basically the same thing that you're saying now, that a lot of folks were already familiar with the stories that were being told and the movies just counted on them to follow along and know what was happening, which is great. But, you know, for, <laughs> for Western eyes, it's, it's sort of a, a jarring trip through the movie. Clearly a lot of differences. Eric, I know you said that they skip over a lot of the middle of the book in the course of this movie. Yeah, there's a the big chunk of the middle of the book is the training of Guo Jing mm. by the Seven Freaks of the South. There are some parts that feel that like match up pretty well uh, when they run into uh, Mei Chao Feng and her husband and they there's piles of skulls around. I feel like in the book that is it almost comes out of nowhere. It's a really fun addition in the book, but it's like we need a spicy part in the book. And it shows up. And this one, they just sort of like roll from one scene right into that scene. And I thought that was kind of an interesting choice. Uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense, but but it does keep the tension up and it adds another fight into the storyline. Yeah, I thought in that way, it was really much, very much like a stage play because a lot of things happen kind of on the, at like the same location, for example. Mm-hmm. So... A big section of what I could tell that they cut out was was just sort of the raising of Guo Jing and like the where the characters that took the children, their sort of their path and the introduction to the Seven Freaks of the South and getting to learn all of learn about all of these characters. You learn them in the novel. And obviously, I think they were like, look, everybody knows who these characters are, so we can just skip that part and get right to the action. He's grown up. We're, we're pressing forward. The duel is approaching. One of the things that I thought was unusual about the movie was that the middle of the movie feels like the movie. And then when Huang Rong and Guo Jing run off to Peach Blossom Island, I know it's in the novel, but like it sort of feels like that movie ends and then this part starts almost episodic. I think... This version really focused on like the romantic subplot, mm-hmm. like a lot because of the focus on that final scene. Like we spend, I think, like five minutes l- listening to Huang Dong's dad play his flute. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, and I, I felt like, especially in the book, that's something that probably would have taken a little more time, but I, I don't really know. A- another thing that stuck out to me is that at the beginning of the movie, we set up Guo Jing and Yang Kang as these sort of rivals. And it's interesting, first of all, because 
their rivalry has nothing to do with their decisions. They're infants, and these two factions think that they offend each other, and the way that they resolve it is by saying, okay, we'll tell you what, we'll take these kids, we'll train them up, we'll have them fight 18 years from now, and that'll be the resolve that we need. And you, you think to yourself, oh, this is going to be a major part of this movie. You know, like what, what's going to happen when these two finally duel? And then very quickly, like you said, Yulin, it really starts to focus on the romance between Guo Jing and Huan Rong. And Yang Kong just kind of disappears. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I'm sure he comes back in later movies or something and, and definitely later in the book. But is he more of a presence in the book throughout this section or does he kind of disappear in the same way? So that actually really stood out to me as well. For me, I felt like in this movie, we really got kind of the beginning of the series and the end of the series. So but it is like a four book series, it sounds like in English, and it's four volumes in the Chinese edition I have. So there's a lot that happens in the middle. And one of the big thing for me was like the coaching like revenge plot for the for his father's death, basically. And that involves like Yang Kang as well and involves like going into like certain parts of like Zhang Nan, I think in the South, Southern China, um, that we don't really see at all in this movie. So that was like a big time skip for me. And that would have included like Yang Kang, his plot line as well. I don't think we get to see much of his childhood, but we do learn a bit and we do kind of meet him later on and he does have like a big role in the story. And the series after Legend of Condor Heroes is actually about like the kids of Guo Jing and Yang Kang. So we've got multiple generations here. We've got the original heroic parents and then we've got Guo Jing and Yang Kang and then eventually we find out about their kids as well. Yeah. Cool. I want to make sure I understand something you said earlier too. You said that the movie is the beginning and the end of the story. Are you talking about the full four volume series? So it's like the end of this movie is the end of that four volume series as well? It's not the complete ending, but like the marriage to Huang Rong is one of the key kind of ending plots. So wow, okay. it is like the end of the romantic plot and that kind of comes to near the end of the series. Yeah. I see. So they really skipped over a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I gotta watch the Brave Archer two and the Brave Archer three. Yeah, no kidding. To, to figure out how they how they fix that mess. Yeah, yeah. So I'm really curious what what happened to the other ones. <laughs> I was yesterday. I was watching like a TV adaptation, the 2017 one, and personally, I actually really like that one. So I recommend it if you want to see like a more extended version. Very cool. Do you know is that available on like a streaming service or somewhere? Um, I think it's on YouTube. All right. Excellent. Cool. That's how we watched Smiling Proud Wanderer as well. So yeah, if folks are interested, head over to YouTube to check it out. I wanted to talk a little bit about the strengths in the different media here. You know, we've got a book that's a four volume series. We've got a movie that is a at least three movie saga. I know that there are some spinoff movies that came in this series too. And then we've also got some TV adaptations. and. Different media work better for different things. And I wanted to explore a little bit of where their strengths are. So let's talk about the book first. What are some of the things that the book does that can't really be replicated in other media? So one of the things that stood out to me when I was reading the book was, for example, the opening actually begins with a storyteller. And the backstory... Um, is often skipped with a lot of the film and TV adaptations. They instead choose to start with kind of the brothers. And I think that's like a very different kind of choice because cinematically that works really well. But um, in the book form, it's really cool to get that kind of storyteller frame. Yeah, so it's like they're, when you're reading the book, you're hearing the story from a, a third party or something. Yeah, and there's some backstory there that's kind of, reappears later on as like an important plot point, but we don't know at the beginning. So it's just a storyteller telling a story about some people in like a village. Very cool. And I could see on the one hand, you know, Princess Bride is a good example of how that can be handled well in a movie. But on the other hand, I think to myself, 
that was already a very big cast. <laughs> Maybe they made a decision to not grow that even more, but it's too bad because like you say, that's a really effective thing to do. Are there any other things here that are really sort of the domain of books that movies just can't handle? I think another thing is just it leaves leaves a lot to the imagination with books, right? So we all maybe when we read it, get like a different picture of who Guo Jing is. Mm -hmm. And every kind of wuxia movie director will try to kind of find the perfect Guo Jing, the perfect Yang Kang the perfect Huang Rou, and then people will argue about, oh, like, is this actress a good Huang Rou or not? Yeah, and certainly, and, and, you know, dream casts are a thing, especially when you've got uh, multiple adaptations of a story. And so you might, like, I think about Les Mis, the musical or something, and, like, you know, you, everybody's got their favorite Jean Valjean and everybody's got their favorite character X, Y, and Z. But in any one adaptation, you're right, you're not going to find the exact perfect cast or whatever and there's going to be contention whereas in a book you can kind of live in that difference there something that i think is interesting i'm wondering about this so in a film when there's a fight you just get a choreographer and you film the fight and you can see it happening in a book you're much more reliant on the mind's eye and i'm curious to hear what the two of you think in terms of which one of those is maybe better i think they both have their strengths uh one of the things about the novel is that we get a lot of kind of shorthand with like evocative technique names and they'll say you know they'll say that they go and they do this technique against this person and they respond this way and you kind of get a sense from context like what's going on and sometimes it's very good and it's very breathless and sometimes it's a little more removed whereas from the movie i went and i specifically rewatched a lot of the the really dramatic fight scenes from the movie just to see like where the dramatic like push and pull points were in it and a lot of those in the movie are actually they're actually pretty good even if they don't necessarily tread on the like the specific names of styles uh, like like the they do in the Jin Yang novel. Uh, Yilin, did you have do you have a sort of a, a preference or a feel of of what makes one better than the other? Or yeah, I find that to be a really interesting kind of question because for me, I think the nice thing about the film versions is that you do get to like see the martial arts and you get to see the fight scenes very vivid, and it can be done like really well. And that's something that's harder to do speaking as a writer as well just like writing a fight scene is very difficult it can often be hard to like visualize i think when you read or when you write about it in the novels we do get like the very poetic names for example junio has a lot of like historical allusions where he names moves based on like actual legends or like poetry or things like that so that's like an interesting layer especially for chinese speakers that might be hard to translate. Um, the other thing I found really interesting is that a lot of wuxia writers from my research, they didn't know any martial arts. So a lot of it was like them going to a book and like making uh, moves, basically. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so I was yeah kind of surprised when I read that, but that's what Jin Yong did. He would, like had a ton of books, a ton of like martial arts manuals, lying around his house and sometimes he would be like okay now i need to find like a move for like this character and then he would like based on maybe like a training manual he would kind of write like a fight scene but like he didn't actually know any martial arts that's really interesting so we interviewed fonda lee another author uh who is publishing the Greenbone saga and uh, fonda lee is a martial artist. And so she cares a lot about putting really evocative fights into her books. And it's great to read. But yeah, I get the sense that a lot of writers really don't have much training. And we've talked before about how, especially in wuxia, violence is a form of communication. It's a way to express the personalities and drives and stakes of the characters in the story. And talking about really evocative names of techniques in a book, I can really see how that would help to tell the story of the fight and the story of the characters in the fight. Yeah, for sure. And it really helps kind of to establish kind of characters and kind of what makes them different. And I think good films would also kind of play with that and try to make like each character's moves like very really distinctive and kind of based on like their personality 
and hopefully like reflective of the name. I have a question about, so we've got sort of like Jin Young on one side who doesn't know, you know, who maybe doesn't know martial arts, right? And has to go and sort of consult and make some stuff up and kind of put it together. And then maybe we have somebody, you know, uh, like Yu Lin or, or Fonda Lee who you know, knows some martial arts or, you know, has done some training. Is there a path to sort of like make those things meet in a way? Because, you know, we, we talk a lot about gaming, role-playing games on this, and it's an oral medium. So we have to be describing these things and making them interesting. So we're always looking for a way to take sort of like the technical aspect and the dramatic aspect and sort of put them together. And I don't know if you have any insight coming from one direction or the other of maybe what makes a good descriptive fight scene. Yeah, I think that's like a very tricky question. Um, I've done a little bit of martial martial arts training um, in terms of like Ching Chen style martial arts and a bit of Tai Chi. Um, but I've also met Fanda very briefly at a convention, and I know she has like a lot of background in martial arts. So like someone like her would be very, very good at writing fight scenes. But then on the other hand, we do have a lot of writers who just don't know martial arts at all. And I think every writer, sometimes they will like work to their strengths. For example, um, Gu Long, who um, is also like a Taiwanese um, wuxia writer. And her style is often like contrasted with Jin Yong. And he doesn't know martial arts either. And what he often does with his fight scene is literally have like a standoff. Like one character cuts like another character down and the fight is over. If you have read Jin Yong's, the translation of Legend of Condor Heroes, you can probably tell like Jin Yong's fight scenes are more descriptive than Mm. that, right? So I think every writer has like their own style. What you said about the way Gulong approaches fights reminds me a little bit of the movie Hero in the fight between Nameless and Sky, played by Jet Li and Donnie Yen, respectively. They're in this chess house and they're standing facing each other and playing out the battle in their minds before they ever actually trade blows. And then the actual fight from a physical perspective is really only one stroke each to determine who's the winner there. Is Gulong's style like that? Or is it, it, so is there sort of a a rich interior life to the characters during the course of a fight? Or is it the case that the fights are just really short on the page? I think what happens with Gulong is he's very focused on atmosphere. Mm. So like, he might give like a very poetic line about like one character's move, like how the sword moves and use like a metaphor to describe that. And then the other character's dead. And then we move on. So it's almost like... I think of his style as almost like a fairy tale or like a legend as opposed to like really realistic in the sense that we're really grounded in like a concrete fight. Very cool. So it's almost like Gulong makes up for a shortcoming of practical knowledge about a fight by instead describing the atmosphere that that fight takes place in and connecting it more closely to the people who are engaged in that fight. Yeah, he's very into kind of atmosphere and character and kind of emotion. Cool. Yeah, and that seems like it would be a really compelling approach as well. Even if you're not seeing beat by beat what the fight looks like on the page, being able to know the emotional connection is what makes a fight really interesting anyway. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it makes me think about uh, the the episodes that we did before this one were on two different adaptations of a Gulong novel. So we did uh, Death Duel and Swordmaster, which was a more recent version. And uh, so I'm, I'm sort of like, while you're talking, I'm thinking about, about those movies and whether they represent what you describe of his prose. And I think they've sort of made it a little more exciting for for the screen, right? Because you can. But I was just thinking about sort of like the emotional lives of those characters, like driving driving the story forward. The fights are important, but it's really the the emotional lives and the atmosphere of the world that that pulls them through that's yeah and Gulong's books are famously really difficult to adapt Mm -hmm. like fans often talk about not having like a favorite Gulong movie or not being able to find one they really like who that they feel is really like true to a book um Mm -hmm. and I think that has to do with that kind of his focus on atmosphere Well, and you know, so two things about those movies that we watched. First of all, we acknowledge that both of them had great set pieces, similar to Gulong's more atmospheric approach. 
And also, we didn't exactly like either one of them. So, <laughs> so that kind of holds true. <laughs> um, I want to talk about the nature of really huge character lists in wuxia novels. When we're dealing with a four-volume series, we have a lot of room to introduce a lot of characters. And obviously, in this movie, we had to do a lot of work to boil that down to the bare essentials. So in the novel, is is the character list even larger? Did they just cut out a lot of characters for the movie? Or, or what's the story there? Yeah, in the novel in Chinese, there are even more like minor characters. Or there are certain subplots of a lot of minor characters that we just don't really get to see. Even in some of the longer drama ad- adaptations I've seen, they will have to gloss over like certain details. Um, and in this one, it definitely does. Because, like, for example, um, there's a lot more backstory to, like, the seven freaks that we don't really see in a lot of this. Um, There's other characters related to, like, the Taoists. There's other Taoists who are involved in this conflict. Um, There's conflict with the Mongolians and the Jin people and then the Song people, like, the three kind of groups. There's The story takes place in against kind of this historic backdrop of a conflict among these three different groups. And we don't really see that here either. Yeah, I got the sense that there was a broader sort of geopolitical conflict there, but it was definitely well in the background of this movie. Right, because especially Guo Jing gets, he gets raised by the Mongols. Yang Kong does. Yeah. Uh, no. no. Oh, really? Wait, I thought Guo Jing got raised by the Seven Freaks. Who were in Mongolia. Oh, dang. Okay. Yeah. See, that's another detail that I totally missed from the movie. I, I guess I realized that they were in the north, but I I didn't connect that to being Mongolia. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's it was it was too complicated to sort of like interrupt the flow of the of the summary <laughs> to be like, no, there's there's more north. Not northern China, but like beyond northern China. Okay. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I want to know, I want to talk about from like a fictional perspective. Not the difference between books and and films, but like dealing with these huge character lists. You know, sometimes it comes up in like a tabletop game or in a story or something like that, where you end up with a lot of these extra characters. And when I was reading the novel, uh, I I really liked how Jin Yong sort of like infused these characters with at least a, a, an interesting detail. Like when you meet the seven freaks for the first time, I was telling Eli about this that they are all a superlative of one type or another that, you know, one of them is the strongest person or one of them is the wisest person, you know? And, and so he uses these superlatives to like give you a quick sketch. And then if they continue on, then, then it kind of fills them in, but the world feels very full, right. With, with all of these characters. So I think sort of what are the pros and cons of having like these big character lists? How do we make sure that like they all seem important, even if some of them will fade away? Yeah, that's tricky. I find that really tricky to juggle when you have like a very big cast of characters. I think what you just said about like what Jin Yong does with giving them like a key detail, that is one thing that really stands out to me as well. Um, is that like, for example, we know Guo Jin is the one who's maybe like not too bright, but very sincere and like very hardworking. And, like, we know, like, Huang Rong is, like, very intelligent and, like, very, um, like, that's kind of her main character trait. We know things about, like, the Southern Venom or, like, the other characters that kind of set them apart. So I think part of it in Wuxia is also, like, having, like, a title, for example, Mm -hmm. Um, knowing what order they're from, knowing what kind of martial arts they do, like, what kind of history they have. A lot of that kind of help us ground the character. Very cool. So it, with it, when you think about a role-playing game, you're often thinking about building the character sheet, and you've got this list of traits that your character embodies. And a lot of role-playing games don't really address much the history of your character. That's something that they leave to you to determine on your own. But I really like this notion that the style that they use, the lineage of that style, the history of the character and how that matches up with the style. Those are really cool considerations for something that might have 
a mechanical effect in the context of a game. It's an interesting dr- dramatic effect as well, because there's a part in the novel where Guo Jing is, he's not a very good student. He's, you know, he's just not very bright. And he ends up getting sort of secretly trained by a, a different Taoist. And he d- he doesn't even realize he's being trained. That's how subtle the, the teaching is. And Yang Kong is secretly also getting trained by Mei Chao Feng. So they have kind of a, a mirror there. We have like one technique or, you know, in Guo Jing's case, we have the, the seven freaks training him. Right. And then there's this like minor dramatic dust up when they find out that he's got another teacher. And then Yang Kong's kind of got like a, a mirror one as well. He's got a mirror sort of dramatic conflict that comes up because, you know, he has the Taoist and then he also has Mei Chao Feng as his as his trainer. So there's even more room for secrets to be sort of embedded in your training and your past to fill into those spaces. Yeah, I like that. Something you were saying earlier struck me too. You were talking about how Guo Jing is not super bright, but he's really sincere. And Huan Rong is really intelligent. And the moment in the movie where I think we see that clearest is during this series of tests to find out which suitor is more appropriate for Huang Rong. And the recitation section, Huan Rong is like, oh, Guo Jing's pretty, but he's stupid. We are never going to be able to like be together now because this test is just too hard for him. But Guo Jing is really sincere, and he sincerely wanted to do right by Zhu Botong, who drilled that poem or, or manual or whatever it was into Guo Jing over months and months. And so we see that he uses his sincerity to overcome the weakness of his low intelligence. And that's maybe like the clearest moment for that part of the character. And we also get a glimmer of Huan Rong's intelligence because she knows how worrisome that situation is. She also shows off in, I think it's a Jin palace yeah. where there's all of these, these other sort of dastardly fighters. And she is, she buys Guo Jing time to go find Yang Kong's father and his adopted daughter. Oh my gosh. There's so many plot lines. Um, <laughs> but she, she buys him more time right by by engineering these challenges between you know one sort of one person at a time playing to her strengths and being clever yeah she like draws the circle on the floor and she establishes a condition that as long as this guy doesn't get out of the circle then he wins right well he he establishes that one and he establishes that and then she figures out how to keep him in the circle while she gets to leave Mm -hmm. and there's a there's another fight scene where they put cups of wine on their heads and their hands and whoever spills first. And she's clearly like, it's, it's sort of like in uh, smiling proud wanderer where we have a character sort of set up the conditions of a conflict so that they have an advantage. And it also shows off something about their character. Yeah. And Huang Rong um, in the books as well, her intelligence is like a very key plot point because she is often helping Guo Jing to like solve certain issues and certain certain conflicts and problems and she's the one who kind of gets the northern beggar to teach them basically very cool and the northern beggar is the one who teaches the dragon 18 palms to Guo Jing I'm trying to remember how that goes in the movie I feel like it's a much more straightforward sort of situation it's not necessarily that he teaches Guo Jing through deception or through cleverness or cunning, I feel like it's just kind of a, oh, hey, you gave me a whole chicken. So yeah, I'll teach you some stuff. That sounds about right. Yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. yeah. So, you know, some of the things that are cut for the sake of screen time are, are not great. <laughs> it's too bad we lost that. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, so what happens in the book is um, Poirot actually guesses that the beggar is the northern beggar by seeing that he was like missing i think like a finger which is like one of his traits and because the northern beggar likes food and kind of prepares all these fancy dishes to kind of bribe the northern beggar into like really liking their food and therefore feeling kind of he owed them something and then she kind of makes an ask and wants to become his student basically Gotcha. So we kind of get the barest taste of that, no pun intended, in the movie. (laughs) Mm -hmm. She does notice the finger in the movie. Yeah, yeah. I do remember that, yeah. Mm -hmm. She kind of figures it out and manipulates him a little bit. Mm -hmm. 
it just happens so quickly that it doesn't necessarily seem like a, a a display of of really strong cunning or something. Yeah, you know, it's a movie. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. <laughs> and I love the hint of that. So, moving on from the movie and the book and all of that talk, uh, Yilin, you uh, interviewed Anna Holmwood, who was the translator for the first of the Legend of Condor Heroes volumes, so A Hero Born. And in that, you asked her a really interesting question, and I wanted to get your take on the question that you asked her. So the question that you asked her was, one of the challenges of translating A Hero Born is working with unique diction, such as martial terms like Wu Lin, the martial forest, and Zhang Hu, rivers and lakes, the honorifics, Shifu, and titles of characters, Seven Freaks of the South, and the martial arts moves that are both descriptive and filled with illusions. When translating these, how do you navigate between domestication and foreignization? That's something that Eli and I, that we are particularly sensitive to, not being Chinese in any sort of way, and that, you know, when we work on these projects, that we want to make sure that the, you know, we have we have a lot of different things that we have to contend with. We have being true to the source material, being respectful to the source material, but also being accessible. So when you translate, how do you navigate between the domestication and the foreignization? And sort of like, what does that entail? Yeah, so for me, that is a decision that I'm always having to make as a translator. When I look at, for example, when I was translating the short story, the Wuxia short story I was working on, it was like sometimes as simple as the author using like a certain saying or phrase that's unique to Mandarin. And maybe I can find like an English equivalent possibly. Mm -hmm. Or do I keep the original kind of metaphor and idiom instead? And kind of finding that balance between like, do I want to make it, do I just want to kind of adapt it? Or do I want to try to keep the original flavor? And I think it really depends on like the context and every situation would be different. But because I think a big part of my work as a writer is I'm very interested in style and interesting language, I do often lean towards trying to preserve the thing that I'm translating, even if it means maybe I have to add more footnotes or more explanation, or the reader has to do a bit more work in assessing what it is that I'm translating. I do think there's like the advantage of that. And I also do think if people are very interested, maybe they would be willing to do that work. And I also want to maybe be translating for people who are, say, um, culturally Chinese, even though they're not Chinese speakers, for example, who maybe already have some background and I don't want to over-explain. Sure. So it really is, it, it's, you have an artistic challenge and then you also have uh, a sort of cultural challenge of like who you're talking to and like how much is it sort of like a matter of trust of like how much you can trust the reader? In a way, I think that is partially it. And also I think maybe as more translations happen and people get used to translations, for example, and people start understanding, becoming more familiar with certain like terminology and having like a general understanding of how like the language is different, they would be maybe also more open to like, you keeping original words like Zhang Fu, for example, instead of trying to translate it. And that's a very tricky one, I find. So first of all, I want to say that I've seen some really cool conversations between you and other writers on Twitter about the sort of cultural context of a lot of Mandarin phrases and uh, concepts and things like that. I think Katya Shah and Jeanette Ng and you have all had some really cool things to say about the almost impossibility of translating the context of some of these poetic quotes and that sort of thing. Um, so for anyone who's listening, if you don't already follow Yilin on Twitter, you really should because you're going to get access to some very cool stuff like that. I also want to point out that we know a, a guy in the RPG world by the name of James Mendez Hodes, and he has a uh, master's in Eastern cultural and religious studies. He's publishing a role-playing game right now called Thousand Arrows, and he has decided to sort of domesticate everything as a way to avoid 
appropriation and that sort of thing. So this Thousand Arrows is about uh, it's a it's a Japanese setting, and instead of calling them samurai, he calls them knights, and the game is full of stuff like that. Like Eric said, we are really trying to decide between the two of us if we want to use something like, do we want to say the martial world or do we want to say Zhang Hu? And like you say, there are a lot of considerations that are tied up in this. Where do you think you fall on the spectrum here between complete domestication and complete foreignization? Do you think it's really contextual or or do you think there's like a, a best practice to follow? I think it's contextual um but i would say i'm leaning maybe more towards the foreignization Mm -hmm. and i think that also has to do with kind of what i'm translating and why i'm translating so for example recently i've been translating a lot of traditional chinese poetry and for me a big part of that is not just the meaning but also like the language and style itself so trying to preserve some of like the metaphor and idiom even though it might become like more ambiguous. Yeah. What is your experience translating this poetry? Are you sticking to like a meter that's in the native language or are you really adapting it in that case and preferring to go along with the imagery instead? What's the what's the process for you there? Yeah, I'm working with few verse. So luckily I'm not working too much with meter and rhyme. I have done a bit of like ancient classical poetry and Jeanette on Twitter we have often had conversations about translating kind of more classic poetry. And in Chinese classic poetry, it, there's a lot of strict rules about the number of syllables each, for each line and also a rhyme scheme as well. But because Chinese is a language where every character is one syllable, you have just a lot of rhyme happening all the time. It's not as noticeable as in English. And it's much easier to rhyme in Chinese than in English. So if you try to translate like a foreign line Chinese classic poem into English and you force it to rhyme, it sounds like a limerick. Okay. You know? <laughs> it's like really beautiful in Chinese. So yeah. yeah. And limerick, you know, as, as fun as they are, are not typically considered beautiful in English. <laughs> it, it's a very different feel, I think. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that's that's really fascinating. I I thank you for sort of filling me in. I was really interested, especially having read the novel and sort of going, hmm, I wonder why the translator Anna Holmwood made sort of these choices with some of these phrases or these character names and that sort of thing. And I wanted to get your take on it as well. So thank you very much for, for filling me in on that. One quick thing that we haven't really discussed explicitly, but Yulin, you don't play role playing games, right? So I've done a little bit of tabletop gaming, actually. Um, I play D&D casually sometimes with friends. And actually last, when you were mentioning earlier about like Wuxia games, last, last summer, I think? No, last, I think last fall, I hosted a one-shot D&D game um, that's kind of set in the world of my novel. Ah, so oh, fun. I, yeah, I tried to like apply... D&D to my world, which was really hard. Because <laughs> yeah, I believe it. And D&D are very different. Yeah. Um, so we created and invented a lot of rules and equivalencies and like simplified a lot of things because it was also a one shot. But it was really interesting. And um, some of my friends kind of knew more about Wuxia than others, but I kind of gave them a lot of background and I had them kind of build like mini character backstories that was like related to my world and things like that. So Yilin, before we let you go, can you tell us about some of your your active projects that you're working on now? You had mentioned that there was um, some kind of like folktale or folklore thing that you're working on. Yeah, so I'm currently working on a collection of short stories as part of my MFA in creative writing in Canada. And what I'm doing is I'm writing a collection of kind of speculative fiction some like fantasy, some soft sci-fi, maybe surrealist um, stories, a lot of them drawing on folklore. So that includes like retellings, but also, or just having, for example, a character make like allusions to folktales in the story itself, or like having like the folktale somehow be like integral to the plot. Mm-hmm. So I'm working with a lot of old Chinese kind of legends 
And I think one of them is actually Wuxia and possibly another one that I'm writing or I will be writing soon will also be Wuxia. Very cool. And what is it that drew you toward drawing upon folklore and legendary here for this project? I grew up with a lot of these stories and my grandpa, for example, would tell me like stories about like the three kingdoms, if you're familiar with that, mm-hmm. or stories about like the monkey king, stories about different like journey through the West. And I really enjoyed that as a child. And that's something that kind of drew me to a lot of fantasy and sci-fi later on. Um, but I look now at what books are being published in English, and I still find there's like a big lack, I think, of maybe non-Eurocentric kind of folklore and stories set in like non-Eurocentric settings. Even though we have seen, I think, a lot more changes over the past few years, um, I do want to support more of that, and I'm very interested in like own voices work. So I wanted to kind of try this project. That's wonderful. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Three Kingdoms and The Monkey King and Journey to the West, those are all uh, much beloved tales, of course. Um, So that's that's going to be really cool to see those remixed and referenced and that sort of thing in the short story series. Are are you drawing upon anything that you would consider to be, you know, super obscure from folklore or legend? Are there any are there any things that you think are really going to surprise people? Um, I would say most of the tales I'm working on are maybe not the ones that are super well known, because I think that makes for like a more interesting story, is more creative. Sparrow, which I don't know if you read, I think draws on like the legend of Sparrow, for example. So that's one of the stories actually that I'm hoping to include in the collection. So that would be like an example of what I've done. And Sparrow as a folk tale character is maybe known by some folks in China, but he is not super well known or they're not super well known and definitely not like outside of the Chinese speaking world. Very cool. Yeah. And I'm glad to hear that that story is going to show up in your anthology too, because um, I love the way that you use the folktale to emphasize the melancholy of your, of your main character in that story. It's, it's cool to think that you know, folklore is often a kind of escapism for the people who are telling these stories. It's it's a way to impart cultural values and wisdom and that sort of thing, but it's also a way to just get away from the humdrum of life. And you've really evoked that really well in the Sparrow story. So that's cool to know that, like, I guess more of the tales are going to be going along those lines as well. Yeah, I think some of them will definitely be drawing on that as well. A lot of the Folk tales come from Tang and Song dynasty because in the Tang dynasty there were a lot of it was kind of one of the peaks of Chinese folk tales I would say just because we got a lot of stories about Yao Guai a lot of stories about like magic about kind of um, wuxia characters for example like some of the seven freaks I think or at least the seven sister she is her character is based on like a folklore hero who is like, I think one of the first women to be like a sword fighter in Chinese legends. Oh, cool. So there's a lot of stories from kind of that era that I'm really interested in. And a lot of them are now well known. Mm. Are you just going to let your adaptations and remixes and, and this particular project sort of stand on their own or are you going to like you know in a preface or footnotes or whatever sort of fill people in on on what you're talking about uh, in turn like what you're referencing? Yeah, that's really interesting. I haven't thought about that. I do write nonfiction as well, and I do translate. So, and maybe one possibility would be trying to translate some of the original ancient texts of some of these folk tales that I reference. Sure, or even just like a summary. Yeah, sometimes I think people can kind of just grasp it on their own, and maybe like someone who knows the background will grasp more, like an Easter egg, basically. Mm-hmm. Sure. I mean, that's the joy of folk tales, right? Is that their their meanings are are right there, and you can dig deeper if you want to, uh, like you are. But uh, they are folk tales. They are for folk. 
right? To just understand and take in. So yeah, that's really interesting. I'm excited to see this project. And thank you so much for coming and talking to us and watching the movie and talking about the differences in the book. Uh, we really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for having me. It was great. Yeah, if like we said, if anybody wants to check out Yilin's work, uh, we've got her website and her Twitter handle in the show notes. And you can check her out at Yilin Writer on Twitter if you don't want to go to the show notes. You can find most of uh, the links that she's got from there as well. So thank you so much, Yilin, and best of luck with this uh, project of yours as you wrap up your MFA. Thank you. All right, so thanks for listening, everyone. And remember to make your Kung Fu stronger. John Who Hustle is being released on Misdirected Mark Productions, the media arm of Encoded Designs. If you're enjoying the show, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash Hustle. You can reach Eli at ZapDynamic on Twitter or on his website, mythicgazetteer.com. You can reach me at Eric M. Farmer on Twitter or at my website, dogpoweredvehicle.com. You can reach both of us at Hustle on Twitter or or Hustle at gmail.com, or on the Misdirected Mark website. Thanks for listening.